Welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Simone Farezin, and I am the co-founder with Andrea Trimarchi of a design office here in Milan and Rotterdam called uh, Forma Fantasma. But we are also the curators of this edition of Prada Frames. If, if you have been attending the session in the morning, please be patient. I'm going to repeat some things, but I think it is important for the people who just arrived to know more about Prada Frames. Um, me and Andrea, we have been practicing in the field of design since 2009. And we have always been interested in the ethical implication that the act of design uh, entails. And we share with Prada an interest in uh, the dissemination of knowledge, as this symposium uh, is about. And in this respect, I would like, before to talk about Prada Frames, thank a person who supported um, this project since the beginning and trusted us in its content, and this person is Mrs. Prada. Um, Prada Frames is a symposium that investigates the complex relationship between the environment and design outcomes. Under shared ecological lens and with a transdisciplinary approach, the symposium brings together designers, architects, curators, scientists, anthropologists, producers, activists, legal and economic experts. Considering the fact that Prada Frame is running in parallel to the uh, Salon del Mobile di Milano, the International Furniture Fair, we thought it was pertinent to focus on the idea of the forest on the governance of the timber industry, but also to go beyond that and to recognize forests as also a place that is inhabited by a multiplicity of species, both human and more than humans. Of course, we must acknowledge also the place we are in because it's a fantastic location. It's the Biblioteca Nazionale Braidense. Uh, it is a perfect location for many reasons. If you think about in this moment, we are surrounded by a forest in the form of walnut shelvings, in the form of paper pulp books, and wooden fibers, and of course the furniture you're sitting on. Of course, it is also a place of knowledge conservation and so, and so on. Um, and with the Braidense, we actually also um, asked the curators to select a series of books uh, related to the vegetal world that are exhibited at the entrance in some vitrines. And uh, we also uh, made a film that you most probably have seen while you were coming in the room. That it's called Dendrografia in Suberica, which is an exceptional archive of wood specimen from the region of Lombardy, where we are in, done in 1793 by Carlo Somaschi. In our first session in the morning, we look at ways of understanding and perceiving the forest differently. In this session, we will directly dive into the crucial relationship between design and ecology more at large. We will also close with a very exciting conversation about different ways of narrating the climate crisis. With no further delay, I would like to introduce our first speaker for the section session, which is Dan Handel, who is a writer, curator, working on research-based projects with a special attention to unexplored ideas and practices that shape contemporary built environments. He created forest-related exhibitions for the Canadian Centre for Architecture at New Institute in Rotterdam, and is currently developing a manuscript on the uneasy kinship between design and forests. With his presentation, Dan is going to give an historical overview of the relationship between design, humans, forests, and timber. He will also introduce the forest as a repository for cultural production, myths, and metaphor. Dan, please, welcome. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon session. My name is Dan, um, and thanks so much for being here. So, first of all, I wanted to thank Andrea and Simone from Forma Fantasma for the invitation and for organizing such a great event. I've been uh, working on the fourth subject for quite some time, and it's really such a pleasure to be part of a symposium that includes so many speakers whose work I not only follow but admire. Um, and also, I want to to thank Prada for hosting us in this amazing, really amazing event, uh, venue, as you just uh, mentioned, and, but even more for focusing attention on what I find to be, and I think many people in this room find to be, uh, you know, a timely and really critical subject for our survival in some ways. Um, my talk today is about our ideas and misconceptions and how they shape the world around us. And more specifically, it is about the role of design in all this. Now, I know he was not uh, Milanese, so I hope I'm forgiven uh, for opening with this. 
Um, but Giambattista Vico's words resonate with me ever since I came across them, I don't know, more than a decade ago, probably. Vico, uh, widely considered as the first philosopher of history, uh, sets the tone for today's talk in many ways. Not only is he placing forests, as you can see, as part of human history, so it's not nature that is external to human history, but it's part of, part of our species' history, but he's also uh, arguing that they are an institution, as you can see here. That is, forests are artifice. And how exactly are we to position the forest uh, following Vico or not is related to the idea of the con that I'd like to talk about today, which is the trick that forests play on us so often. And I'll get to that in just a second. But first, perhaps, uh, I can talk about how I began my journey into real and imaginary forests. So what you see behind me is uh, uh, this first moment, moment of discovery, in which I stumbled upon this aerial photography from the Pacific Northwest, the, the American Pacific Northwest. So we are in the boundaries of Montana. Uh, and what seemed at first what, like a Photoshopped image, you see these squares, these forest squares, uh, was in fact a real pattern on the ground. Um, and these squares uh, follow, conform to the one mile grid, which is the famous uh, land ownership grid from the 18th century. Uh, but what we see here is not an 18th century thing, but an economic transaction. Because looking at the history of this pattern, you realize that uh, it looks like that because it was the, the result of a land grant given by the federal government to the railroad companies to fund their operations in the mid 19th century. So the land was given in alternating sections because the federal government wanted to, or was hoping to speculate as the value of the land might rise following the, the laying out of the tracks. Um, years passed and the railroad companies sold their lands to, uh, to, the, uh, to the forest companies. Forest companies clear cut their lands and here we are 150 years later and this pattern is visible on the ground. And if you go there, you could see it quite clearly on the hills and mountains uh, of this part of Montana. Um, and to me, this was uh, a striking uh, moment because first, it made me realize how much uh, forest as an environment is related to design, or to put it in a different way, uh, how much design goes into a forest environment. So if you go to a forest, most of the forests that we know are meticulously designed. They're, in a way, they are design projects. Um, and the other thing that was uh, striking once I sort of dived deeper and deeper into this image was the fact that form in this context means a lot. It, it's not only an aesthetic thing, but it's also the basis for an infrastructural pattern, as you can see here with some of the roads that surround these squares, and also for ecological patterns. Just imagine how an animal would move from one square to the next when they're connected just by one point. Um, but this was not everything, because when I got to, uh, to these areas to sort of try to understand what's going on on the ground, um, I encountered full on what I uh, call the con. Huh? Is it moving? There we are, amazing. Um, and the con is this impression that even in the most industrial of forests, you blink your eye and you suddenly see nature, even as you know that this is an environment designed to the cell, down to the cell. Um, that even in the straight path, you may find yourself in Dante's Selva Oscura, where paradise, hell, and all sorts of divinities are roaming just around the corner. And I began to think, why is this happening, really? And I believe this is partly due to some biological wiring that comes down to us from our ancestors and the forest people we once were in many ways. But it also happens because the forest, unlike a rock or a cloud, is not a thing in the world. It is not an observed phenomena, but rather something that is based on our cultural definitions. It is, in other words, something that we construct in our mind. And to paraphrase uh, the late David Graeber, this means that we can as easily construct it differently. 
And this is why it is important, I think, to uh, know the dispositions and the misconceptions that guide our thinking when it comes to forest. So where does this construction, this idea of a forest, comes from? Um, you may know that the word forest uh, originate from the Latin forest, uh, which means outside. In other words, the defining a forest was a tool to demarcate boundaries between different classes. As you see here in this uh, amazing uh, painting by Paolo Uccello, uh, you see how a, a forest environment is not only serving as the, as the background for the hunt to happen, which is of course an activity affiliated with the higher with the higher classes, but also uh, note how the forest is meticulously designed to allow for this hunt to happen seamlessly. For instance, the forest floor is completely cleared, and this is not for scientific reasons. There's, there are no trees taken out of this uh, uh, forest for production necessarily, but it's cleared for the dogs and the helpers to run, and the, for, the trees themselves are being cut in such a way so the rider on his horse could move uh, swiftly and pursue the hunt. So again, design is related to this idea of demarcation and again to this idea of class. Now, of course, uh, the lower classes would also spend a lot of time uh, in forests, but usually for very different uh, purposes. We know that people have been working in forest environments and extracting stuff out of them for quite some time. And I really love this section from a Tournay uh, tapestry uh, from the 15th, 15th century, mid 15th century, which shows uh, this amazing intensity of just labor, you know, people laboring in the forest doing mundane 15th century stuff, while at the same time they're being surrounded by this incredible intensity of, you know, animals uh, and plants and sort of amalgamation of mythical uh, atmosphere which again brings us back to this ambivalence of the forest as a real environment on the one hand, but then at the same time as this place that resonates all these cultural ideas that we have. Um, and the intensity produces an astonishing variety of products as we well know. Um, and once you, once you really begin to look at all the things that comes out of a forest, uh, you really feel that it surrounds you everywhere, especially if you're doing, you know, a project related to that, you just feel the forest and its sort of outcomes are just like everywhere. Um, and this omnipresence, I think, is an interesting uh, thing to consider as we talk more specifically about uh, a link that I would say exists between uh, design, architecture, and forest. And to me, this is a more specific uh, kinship that is far from esoteric, that goes through the most fundamental ways in which we consider what architecture is. So uh, it goes through uh, some of these moments, and in a way, this image, which is one of the famous images uh, from the beginning of architecture, it's Charles Eisen's celebrated frontispiece for uh, Logier Essay sur l'architecture, which talks about this idea of the primitive hut, and see how the primitive hut, which is this important origin myth for architecture, is partly a uh, hut constructed out of branches and forest material, but partly still alive. So it's still part of the trees. In a way, it still grows. And it is no accident that an uneasy kinship between forest and design exists. Sylvia Lavin recently uh, pointed out that plants and plants share etymological homology as planta and pianta in Italian, leading back to the origins of architecture in Alberti's times, uh, and to a time in which buildings were understood to grow from the ground up, uh, just like plants. And if we establish that there's a naughty, unresolved relationship between forest and design, I would like to demonstrate it through the subject of economy, of all things. And why economy? First, because the kingdom of numbers largely dominate our lives, and design especially. But second, because the kingdom of numbers is the most mystified of kingdoms, and what I would like to suggest is that it is not economy itself, but our ideas about the economy that shaped forests throughout the world and still continue to do so. So uh, the idea that forests uh, could be planned and managed date back hundreds, if not thousands of years. We, we meet all this idea that forests uh, 
uh, could be managed in, a t in antiquity and evidence in both Asian and African records show that the issue was considered by monarchs and bureaucrats alike. But I would like to speak more specifically about a moment in which you begin to think of an idea that uh, entails designing and, and planting a forest from scratch in order to support a specific economic uh, economy. As in this case with Nuremberg, that uh, from the 14th century more or less is deliberately designing its uh, forests. And as we venture, yeah, as we venture uh, into the Renaissance, we see much more sophisticated ideas designing forests. Uh, as in the case of the Venetian Republic. Now, you may know that the Republic was highly dependent on wood supply for its fleet in order to build ships at the Arsenale. And if we just considered that some ships demanded 3,000 mature oaks to build, and at a certain point there existed in the Republic 3,000 ships, both military and civilian, we understand immediately the, the huge pressure on, on uh, forest lands, which demanded uh, strict economic regulation. And what we see here is the mapping, the, the sort of meticulous mapping of forest territories under the Republic and the attempt to control supply, sometimes in very coercive methods. And in the 16th century, the Republic assigns specialized magistrates, Provedatori Sopraboski, to oversee the mapping and analysis of wood reservoirs and report back to the uh, Great Council. Going into the archives of Venice, you find these amazing uh, publications produced at that time by the magistrates, showing how real sites are gradually transformed into these more abstract schemes and then into lists. So basically, the way the Republic understood its real forest lands was through the idea of the list. And uh, Carl Apon, who wrote a brilliant book on the subject, argued that seeing the world through the list, through this bureaucratic idea, um, was really signaling the decline of the empire that failed to grasp the real changes uh, in the material world around it. For us, I think it's an interesting case uh, in the development of a method to shape forest based on economic rationale. Um, I think numbers dictate forest realities even more clearly when we get to modern forestry. And the story of what is called scientific forestry as it developed in the 18th and 19th centuries uh, could be described in many ways, but I would like to, sh to show it by using just one equation. So this is the famous Faustmann formula um, in which the idea was that you could um, basically take uh, ideas from classical economy as developed by uh, Adam Smith or, or David Ricardo and uh, abstract the forest in, to such a degree that the proper time for its cutting can be accurately calculated based on soil rent theories. And what this led to, as James C. Scott uh, pointed out, is to force designed in uniform and geometric organization in order to maximize profit, which became a scientific but as we know, also an aesthetic uh, ideal with links to national identity, uh, as we can see here in the Seelwald near Zurich at the end of the 19th century. Now, these equations captured the minds of foresters and designers for decades, uh, offering an illusion of control and accountability. All that while on the ground, important to say, scientific forestry in its classical forms failed miserably. So the numbers may have added up, but the complex geologies of forest systems simply didn't hold, and they broke down, leading to quick degradation in second and third growth. Now, we know that uh, facts on the ground never stopped a good economic theory from developing. And as Milton Friedman, that you see behind me, once said, theories should be judged by their ability to predict events rather than by the supposed realism of their assumptions words to live by. And indeed, in the second half of the 20th century, we see neoclassical economy creating the world in its image. And it is largely the world that we know today, uh, with products circulating freely between uh, markets and happy consumers that benefit from far away extraction operations that we don't want to think about, right? And here we have the Oracle himself explaining why a simple pencil simple product, connects forests to plantations to mines because it's different, its various parts are produced in all parts of the world, right? The rubber comes from one place, the wood comes from another, what we call the lead comes from another place, and according to his argument, this demonstrates what he would call the magic of the price system. 
in which people who would normally not agree with one another would supposedly collaborate in order for you to buy this uh, simple product for a trifling sum. And you see that he, he even say, says that this simple pencil is a demonstration that this idea of a neoclassical economy would promote world peace. This argument demanded an even greater abstraction of the forest. And we see the big movers of the industry, in this case, the warehouse company, one of the largest landowners in the United States, and a forest company, responding by shifting their thinking from forest to asset. And once you do that, you enable yourself to turn your attention to the various conversion points that we can see here, uh, in which profit could be extracted no matter the social or ecological costs. The forest at this point is about as natural as an Excel sheet, and I would say about as complex, which brings me to what I call the delusion or delusions. Uh, the stories designers tell themselves and others when they seek to design forests or appropriate them for their purposes. Um, stuck for a moment, there we are. It is no wonder that the heyday of Chicago School Economics, which Milton Friedman represents, is also when uh, what we may call green architecture begins. This kinship I talked about earlier now makes an appearance as environmental rhetoric. See, for instance, the same warehouse company, the big forest company, when they invite SOM San Francisco, same year as the report we've just seen, so 1971, to design their headquarters in Tacoma, it is conceived as a forest building, blending in with the trees, only that the actual forest is abstracted to such a degree that once you study the section, you realize that the trees that we see here, and depicted beautifully, are not the actual conifers on site. So it is a reinvention of the forest for a forest company that fits the view from the executive floor. So, you know, the high movers sitting in the fifth floor of this building and how they imagine the land around them uh, to look like. And forest made se several cameo appearances in design in these years, marking, in this case, in the James Vines uh, forest building, uh, from the late 70s, a mythical return to archaic landscapes mixed with postmodern aesthetics uh, that take over you know, a super banal shopping experience in Richmond, Virginia. So that's the context. See how much this has to do, for instance, with Eisen's frontispiece, the primitive hut that we've seen before, uh, or even with Vico's quote with which we opened. And the delusions continue, or they might, yeah, there we are, and the delusions continue the entire green architecture argument rests on the idea that you could offset the harmful effects of architecture by planting enough trees, right? Emilio, Emilio Ambas pioneered this approach in the late 70s in projects such as this, uh, which I think smartly used our cultural predispositions to argue that the introduction of thousands of trees to the urban environment counts as a forest ecology. And more recently here in Milan, thousands of trees, as we know, were craned up to Bosco Verticale. Uh, this is one of the two towers. While this project, I would say, is highly innovative on all technical uh, fronts, it is also based in many ways on the same type of economic reasoning. If we only focus on uh, numbers, trees on the 28th floor can be equivalent to the ecology of Amazonia and climate crisis could be mitigated without us having to give up the comforts of contemporary life. And supposedly, you know, after a couple of decades of uh, crisis, economic crisis, neoclassical economy is bankrupt, or at least this is, you know, what they tell us sometimes. But economic concepts continue to develop, and with them are ideas of the forest. The latest trend is, of course, crypto economy, and Terra O, which is this project, yeah, um, Terra O is a crypto forest, is a model for a crypto forest developed since 2016 by three artists slash uh, uh, crypto experts, and it takes this idea to the next level. According to the concept here, a forest could get to the point in which it would manage its own resources based on smart contracts and token economy. And we have all the buzzwords of the moment, crypto, radical environmentalism, post-humanist thinking, but somehow in between the, the the lines on the website, as if against the will of its human uh, operators, um, the cone lifts its head again. 
And we have these uh, musings by American poet Richard Bottingen, which portray romantic fusing of organic and artificial life. As he writes, I like to think of a cybernetic ecology where we are free of our labors and join back to nature, return to our mammal brothers and sisters, and wo all watched over by machines of loving grace. Again, the straight lines of reason are complicated by divinities and visions of heaven and hell. So whenever such a proposition is brought up, one that offers to renegotiate the relationships between humans, forests, designs, design, uh, and economy, I think we should really ask ourselves, are we witnessing the invention of something new here, or are we just trapped in the fourth of our own delusion? Thank you. Good afternoon. That was such a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Dan. This is Paola Antonelli speaking. I'm introducing the next panel that I'm also part of. And uh, it's, uh, it's quite a beautiful panel that shows three different angles of looking at forests and looking at wood uh, in the design realm. So I'm Paola and I am from the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Originally I'm from Milan, I'm a senior curator there and I'm very proud to be here in this room which is a room that I know since I was a child and it's wonderful to be brought back here. And then uh, besides me there will be two young designers that you might not have heard about, but they will one day become big, so remember their names. It's uh, Andrea Trimarchi and Simone Ferresino, Forma Fantasma, they will also speak. And then last but not least, actually she will come second, is Marianne Goebel, who is a, a, a curator, but also a person that works in the production of furniture. She used to be at Vitra for a long time, then she became the director of Design Miami, and now she is the director of Artec the famed and historic company uh, that is so expert in wood and in forests. So what brings us together, what uh, one, one red thread uh, amongst the four of us is that even though we might have different appellation and different moments in our career in which we take on different hats, we're all curators at heart. We all curate using the tools at our disposal, whether it's the production of furniture or the sale or the curation of, uh, of even commercial fairs, or whether it is actual design, or whether it is whatever I do. But we all use the tools at our disposal to forward an agenda. And what is our agenda? Well, our agenda is trying to convince people, producers, I don't like the word consumer, citizens and uh, curators and visitors to museum have more respect towards the world, towards every single aspect of the world. And today we're talking about forests that are so very dear to us. So while uh, Marianne and uh, Andrea and Simone will talk about their respective takes, I would like just to tell you a little about my relationship to forests and to woods. Um, after working here in Milan for a while, I moved to New York and I started working at MoMA in 1994. My very first exhibition at MoMA was called Mutant Materials in Contemporary Design. It was 1995 and it was a moment a great shift in the culture of materials and design because all of a sudden designers could design their own materials. They didn't have to go back to the chemical industry to have them perfect the resin or they didn't have to, to convince an entrepreneur to make a mold for hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to inject their plastics. No, they could do things almost at home in their kitchen and actually Andrea and Simone were truly making kitchens, even in the basement of the Rinascente, but um, it was really about customizing your own materials. And I remember that in the various sections of the exhibition, there was also one about wood. And at that time, it was very funny because it was all about making wood such an ancient material perform in completely different ways, almost against its, against its nature. There was a new technology to put wood veneer directly onto foam, so you would look at a chair that was almost monastic and very stoic and very square, but all of a sudden it was soft. So it was all about this surprise, and that's why it was called mutant. Well, 
28, 29 years later, next year, I'm going to do a small show at MoMA that is almost like a take on the idea of materials 29 days, years later. 29 days later is that great move, but yeah, 29 years later. And um, so much has changed. And it's not only the way we treat materials, it's not only way, the way materials look, but it's also the appreciation of the life cycle of materials, how they are born in the world and how they go back to the earth whence they came. And it's all about a respect and a different attitude. It's not anymore about the performance of the material, but rather it's the attitude. And I think that that's what you will hear also from Marianne and from Andrea and Simone, trying to convey a sense, almost an animism, and, and a kind of contemporary animism to the world at large. And today, we'll talk about it by talking about forests. And in a way, animism with forests comes almost natural. And uh, you will hear from some of the speakers in the symposium in the next few days how it is natural for all cultures that are not our consumeristic-induced uh, culture in the West. So, Look at it this way. Take these three different angles and viewpoints as three different sets of ammunition to get to the same goal. And I would like now to call to the podium Marianne Goebel. Thank you, Paula. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm glad to share the perspective of a mere manufacturer that's quite intricately linked to the Finnish forest. And um, Artec, sorry to bear, bear with me for a short introduction, Artec was founded in 1935 by two Finnish architects, Anon Alvaralto and two like-minded friends who had a background in uh, fine arts. And it was quite a programmatic endeavor in the true modernist spirit. Our tech, the fusion of art and technology, was to be um, a new um, sales and propaganda center for the housing ideology. And uh, looking at this founding manifest that you see here, it defined three pillars. So Artec was about modern art, industry and interior design, and propaganda in the sense of education or advocacy. And um, so the, the, the founders wanted to bring the art of their time to Finland and the products of the Altos and their idea of modern living to the world through exhibitions and other educational means. And in line with this ambition to bring the furniture to as many people as possible, the Alto furniture was designed for industrial production, so on a really industrial scale. And while Arctic's perspective, and I think that's quite clear in this manifest, was decidedly international, it was to conquer the world, the material culture is very literally rooted in Finland. So the outdoor furniture is mainly or primarily made of birch wood, a local species it was readily available at the time. And the production techniques that are developed for and with, uh, were developed for and with the characteristics of birch. And so what is so specific about the auto furniture from a production perspective? Well, I think, first of all, it was a formal innovation in a very traditional material. At the time, the material of progress was tubular steel. The cantilever had entered uh, the, the living room, the chair without back legs. And the autos were rethinking these typologies and creating free organic shapes in a very traditional material thanks to quite intricate production techniques that they developed. The second aspect, um, uh, sorry, here we see actually uh, components that the autos designed for the cantilever armchairs. Second aspect that we also see here is that of standardization. So the autos think in systems to allow for a large variety of products to be based on the very same elements. And the most versatile component that they came up with is this one. It's an L-shaped leg, also referred to as the little sister of the architectural column. So more than 50 products uh, were based on this column. Stools, chairs, tables, benches, I don't know, uh, cocktail cabinets, etc. But to get there is actually quite tricky because um, the altos were working with birch. And birch is a very hard and dense wood. It behaves very differently from beech wood that can be 
steam band, as Tonnet had invented. Steaming or boiling won't really impress the birch. It won't move. So Alto and a very talented carpenter, they invented their own bending te te techniques to make the birch more malleable. So there, you have a solid piece of wood. You cut slits, you insert and glue uh, veneer sheets, and then under heat and pressure, you can bend it into 90 degrees. So you're creating something like an artificial joint. Now, what does this very specific nature of product and production processes mean for Artex vital connection with the Finnish forest today? Well, I think on the one hand, the focus on one local material and the fact that we still have our own factory in Finland is a great advantage and also a huge privilege. But this focus also means responsibility and uh, dependency. So it asks for a particularly respectful interaction with the forest. And I'd like to single out um, three examples. Um, first, regional sourcing. So 70% of the furniture we sell today are produced at our own factory in Turku, that's in the southwest of the country. And then we still use Finnish birch, and that comes from a sawmill in central Finland. And the wood itself comes from forests in a radius of 200 kilometers around this sawmill. So that's a pretty regional or even maybe local affair. But the challenge, the big challenge we're facing is the economic interest of the Finnish wood industry. Because fast-growing softwood species like pine with short rotation times can, after a few years, be turned into paper pulp or wood composites that have very important production volumes. It's much more interesting for them, uh, for, the, for the wood industry, to, to cultivate than hardwood, like birch, with a long rotation time uh, that only after many years can be processed and turned into long-lasting premium furniture like Artex, and is sold in comparatively low quantity. So here we're facing a dilemma, and moving forward at Arctic, we aim to take a more active role in Finnish forest policy to support the future relevance and availability of, this, of our raw material. Um, secondly, longevity. So make long-lasting products that bind CO2 as long as possible. That should be the task of every manufacturer especially working with wood, obviously. And so that means the furniture we make should last at least as long as the trees that we use have taken time to grow. So in our case, these birch trees are 50 to 80 years old when we take them down. And now, thankfully, after nearly 90 years of continued production, we know that our furniture holds up. And we know this quite well because in 2006, uh, Artec Second Cycle was founded. That's a platform within Artec that buys back pre-loved furniture and makes it available again. And so here we see stools from the 1940s that are still in circulation. The wood ages gracefully. The product holds up physically. It's ready for a second life. Another important aspect for us as a manufacturer is the repairability. And here again, Alvaro Alto did us a great favor because these products have an additive construction logic. So they're very easy to repair. You can just ex exchange one component. You don't have to take apart an intricate construction. Uh, uh, and the uh, second or the third aspect is that we want to use as much material as possible from each tree and turn it into long lasting rather than throw away products. So, here again, thank you, Mr. Alto. The designs themselves foresee a very economical use of wood, and this has been optimized over decades. So the cutoffs in the leg production are actually used to make the seat top or table tops. Um, and then the parts of the wood that we purchase that cannot be used for commercial products are used to heat the factory. So it's quite a round cycle that we're living here at the factory. However, there is a, a big challenge that we're facing, and that is our own quality criteria. So we are told that customers expect really immaculate wooden surfaces without any natural imperfections, as you see it here. This could basically be plastic. No, you see hardly any traces of life. Um, but these flaws are real, and these flaws are rapidly increasing due to climate change and the premium quality wood that Arctic is using and is getting more and more rare. So 
moving forward, here we see actually at the factory some bee quality material where our workers had fun marking them and adding some comments. Um, but so these tiny flaws. <laughs> I, I don't know. I hope it's something. I don't know. <laughs> Finish. <I'm so> sexy. <laughs> but but you see what they've circled in. So these are the tiny flaws that we are told our customers won't expect. So I think it's very clear that moving forward as manufacturers, we need to propose a new aesthetic. Let's call it an aesthetic of imperfection, where which does not hide or simply tolerate natural flaws of the wood, but does actually proudly celebrate their beauty. Uh, to change our customers' supposed expectations. And I think it's actually a great uh, design and educational task for manufacturers and designers alike. So to return to the founding manifest, we think that it's time to add on to it. And we think that by 2030, Arctic will be a forest-centric company as much as it is a design company, which means that Arctic looks at sourcing materials and producing objects on a much longer time frame. Um, the, time, the lifetime of trees. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, And now, Simone and Andrea, maybe come here so you don't. Then we'll redistribute ourselves. This is too small for two, so I will do the, <laughs> the introduction to our perspective. So, of course, as designers, we are obviously interested in materials, but not only in technical terms. Um, a few years ago, we started an ongoing investigation into the governance of the timber industry. Why is this? Well, because we truly believe that if we uh, trust the idea that we have to develop a more sustainable or a word that we prefer more, an ecological thinking in the development of products, we cannot think to resolve um, a problem of ecology only at a product level, but we have to think more on a strategic level. What does this mean? Well, essentially, that it is impossible to think about wood without thinking about the forest too, and how these two reality intersect. Well, of course, for us, in this respect, the case study of Artec was extremely important for us because of all the things that Marianne said. I mean, in these days, it is essentially extremely difficult to find a company that has such a proximity to the, where the place where the wood is actually extracted and processed. For us, this is an extreme uh, opportunity and because of this, we entered in conversation with uh, Marianne, uh, and it was a very open conversation um, where we really tried to think, okay, uh, I mean, you're already doing many great things, but there is a potential that we feel it is amazing because of this. Um, but we also had to structure a conversation that is different than the usual one. So we tried to think, is there a way we can think together about how to collaborate, but beyond the thinking only about product? and maybe including also products. And to do so, we have been welcomed in Artec, and uh, Marianne gave us full access to the company, to the marketing team, but also to uh, the many facets of the people actually working there, to the uh, people of the A factory, but also most importantly, I would say, also to the sawmill where the wood is, is actually uh, extracted. So to understand fully the, the scheme of production where uh, the company is actually leading to. But of course, we also had to think about also how um, such a relatively small reality is intersecting another one, which is much more complex, and it's the one of forestry in, in Finland. To do so, we had to team up with a series of experts in the fields, both from the scientific world, the world of forestry, but also of activists that are really looking from a critical perspective what is going on in Finland. I don't have the time now to explain fully sort of all the different uh, aspects in the politics that shapes forestry in Finland. But something that we have to recognize is that when we talk about forestry in Finland, we talk about paper pulp production. Paper pulp production is one of the biggest industries in, in the world. And in the past in Finland, what was produced was high quality paper. Nowadays, the majority of paper pulp is actually used for packaging to ship products all around the world. Well, um, this industry fully changed the ecosystem of forests in Finland. In fact, when we talk about forests in Finland, we should talk about plantations, not really forests, because primary forests are a different, a different entity, a different reality. But there is also um, another aspect that should be addressed here, and that is that because the industry needs enormous quantities of bulk, and it needs a lot of material, 
The practices that is promoted of forestry uh, extractions of timber is clear cutting, which is, which is essentially cutting enormous uh, patches of land, leaving it without any tree, and then replanting it with specimens that are fast growing to feed industrial demands. So, of course, the, the question here is, and of course these are provocative points that we have been discussing with Arctic, is how can we, uh, how is such a reality, relatively small reality, intersecting this other reality? And I want to talk about a few points. So, um, of course, uh, Marianne talked about the idea of, uh, of using birch, which is a fantastic timber, we all, but we also started questioning in a very open way, are there other, other timbers that we can be used in the production process? Um, the 45% of wood is actually CO2. So trees absorb CO2 from the atmosphere and they turn into wood. So it means that wood should last as long as possible to keep the CO2 in it. So if a fast growing species is the reality in Finland, why can we think of applying this in timeless products that has an application which is not throw away as packaging material? Of course, it's not going to solve the problem of forestry in Finland, but it's more a way to think for, I think, a company that is dealing with wood. And there are already products as part of Artec that are using uh, softwood in uh, exemplary ways. And of course, design can help that. We also talk about durability, and um, Marianne talked about the uh, second cycle project. Um, but we also started thinking, well, if a tree takes 80 years to grow, it absorbs CO2, well, then we should at least think that a product should last as long as possible to make sure that CO2 is not re emitting the atmosphere. And it might sound a sort of provocation, but maybe the rotational time of products, sorry, the warranty of product should be equal as the rotational time of trees in the case of birch, 60 to 80 years. Or maybe there are other opportunities, such as, for instance, the Cycle Cycle Initiative. We also talked about um, carbon offsetting. It's a very debatable concept. Uh, we will ex explore this more in the next days. But uh, carbon offsetting, essentially, it is this idea that we can emit CO2 emissions here and then find solutions in other parts of the world or with economic tools to fix this problem. Sometimes it is about planting trees in another part of the world to reabsorb these emissions. But first of all, we believe sometimes this can be a form of neocolonialism, but also um, uh, who checks on this forest? Who checks if these trees stand for 80 or 60 years? So we started looking together with them at projects that are based here in Europe, which is not about planting trees, but it's rather about protecting local ecosystem and primary forests, which in Finland, because of paper pulp production, they're actually shrinking. Of course, when you look at forestry, we had also to look into who is actually owning forests. And in Finland, something is great is only citizens own forests. Corporations and companies cannot own forests. The second question is, who is actually um, helping citizens to understand how to manage their forests? And again, it's paper pulp producers that then pushes for um, uh, clear cutting as a ways of extracting timber instead of selecting logging uh, trees. But if citizens are owning forests, then maybe there is an opportunity for Artec to develop a culture within the company, which is maybe, at the end of the day, helping their employees that most probably own forests for different ways of managing the forest. This could lead to the development of a culture that maybe in the future will lead for Arctic to uh, have the possibility to maybe have wood which doesn't come for clear cutting, which is a uniform reality in Finland. And then, as Marianne told, be, talked about before, the re-education of the idea of quality in the light of the climate crisis, because as she explained, there's still too many misconceptions of what a natural material is supposed to look in product design. Thank you. Thank you. Let's expand a little bit. Let's Let's expand, okay, perfect. Let's expand a little. These were great presentation. It seems to me like one of, the, um, one of the biggest points that you all made is the need to make it almost impossible to abdicate responsibility, right? It's too easy to plant elsewhere in the world. It's too easy to do carbon offsets. It's instead about responsibility and then you use the magic world changing culture. So um, tree hugging, all right? It's something that is like, old and kind of corny, but it is about, um, it links to what Dan was saying. The, one of the first thing that happens is that you deplant a plant and all of a sudden it becomes uh, a spreadsheet and you forget where it comes from. So um, 
with Cambio, with the exhibition and with so much of your work, you've been trying to bring back a sense of plant in the forest, right? Also Val di Fiemme and the tragedy of all hundreds of thousands of trees cut. So how do you see that happening and what do you need to do to change the perception of the people that buy the product so that they embrace the imperfections, so that they um, come to hug the tree that used to be in their stool? Do you see a lot of obstacles still or do you think it can be done? Well, I would say something. First of all, it's a matter of education. Um, something you mentioned before is the Val di Fiemme. Val di Fiemme, it's nearby. It's like uh, around 100 kilometers from, from here, 150. I don't know, yeah, I don't know if they're familiar. You have to t talk about that. Yeah, it's, it's a very close by location that it was hit by a huge storm in, uh, 90, in 2018. Uh, actually, it was 2018, yes, correct. Yes. And in one night, 40 million trees fall down because of a huge storm. Heartbreaking if you see the images. It's exactly. But, you know, we, are, we have been very used to have these very catastrophic um, images related to climate change somewhere else, not in Europe, not in our home. home. And I think these uh, uh, things that happened in the Val di Femme was, in a way, at least for us as designers, really wide opening because, um, you know, for the first time, you could really see the effect of uh, climate change really, really close by to us. And I think it, that, that specific uh, event changed, in a way, also the, the way we really started to look into a material like wood. Because wood is something that is a commodity. You go to buy in an hardware shop, you use it without even thinking that it's a living being. And Cambio was, for us, a very important um, exhibition that shows us the, uh, this very um, complexity around uh, a, a materiality. I think... The, what you were all talking about is that, of course, there is a lot of education to be done. There's a lot of challenges, but I think what we were trying to, to do with, with our tech is really to understand how we could work on it in, in different ways. From the perspective of the designer, it means also just sort of be involved in conversation that we are usually excluded, or many times we are excluded, which is only focusing on the product. And I think what linked us, it's the fact that um, we were all interested, we were all understanding on the great potential that Artec has because it has this proximity with the uh, production or for the extraction place, which is really, I mean, it is such a simple thing if you think about, but that leads to a completely different way of intending also what, is, what your role is and the way you intersect the forest. And I think this is leading to um, a wider conversation, which hopefully will also lead maybe to products and to different outcomes. But it is really about uh, realizing that position also as a, as a company, as a designer, that you can, you can actually do that. It is as simple as that. It's a form of realization. I also like the fact that there's a fourth actor in this play. There's not only the manufacturer, the, uh, the designer, and the customer. There's also the citizen. I love this idea that citizens own forests in Finland. So you were saying that it's actually the pulp industry, it's the paper industry that educates, that tells citizens how they should feel about forests. But are you instead, as a company, countering that? Are you inserting yourselves in the conversation uh, with, with citizens directly? Well, not yet. But, but we, you will. We, we will. We, we have to, and I think it's a very interesting yeah, task. Also, looking at our founding manifest, the big word propaganda, like Arctic has this will and this, also I think the, the responsibility, especially in Finland, to take a stance. So I wouldn't say that Arctic is a political company, but it has always been an educational company. So I would second you that it's an educational task. And I just remember when I was a child, when the first, um, you know, school material out of um, recycled paper was produced. It was gray and dull and considered ugly, but then it was also considered cool because it meant you understood. And I think this is, we're exactly at the same point again. We need, people in the know need to show that they know and need to be proud that they know. And I think we need, as a, as a company and designers, work with the potential of the citizen who is absolutely willing also to take that responsibility. But we need to make a proposal. It's, it's just exquisitely political, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, also Dan was showing Milton Friedman talking about the pen, the pencil. Um, so much of the work that so many of us, not only in design, but 
in all parts of culture are trying to do right now is debunking the School of Chicago and just like really making people instead look at where objects come from and where they're going. And um, I'm thinking of this idea of local production. You know, I'm thinking of architects like Vinu Daniel in Kerala that's talking about what Gandhi used to say, that things should be built with materials within a 15 mile radius. Um, can our text say that everything comes locally? What about the blue, uh, for instance? I'm just, I've been thinking of all the different components. Yeah, can you it, make that claim? It is for everything that's wood-based material is definitely all regional. Also the I glue. Mean, no, the glue, base. yeah, the glue is also Finnish glue, but also there we're looking into, at the moment we're working actually with a big Finnish company that's part of the big industry of maybe replacing it for, for glue that's, glue that's uh, bio-based. So yes, uh, also the glue. I'm not sure about the hardware, the screws, probably yeah. not. <laughs> we'll get there. Sure. So uh, sometimes, it was Simone and Andrea, sometimes it's easy to forget that you make things, hmm. uh, but you do and you make beautiful things. So this collaboration with Artec, is it going to be also about objects? Or <laughs> yes, we are. Of it's course. my aunt's yeah. fault. It's my aunt's fault. No, at some point, I think when we started the conversation, we deliberately said, let's keep the products out of it. Let's first understand what creature we're working with. And so for the last, what was it, two and a half years, yeah. it was mainly looking at the Finnish forest. And now there will be an exhibition in June in Helsinki yeah. dedicated to the topic. And now in parallel, yeah. we have slowly started talking about Something we found the amazing, like in the discussion that we had with uh, Marianne and with Artek, is that for the first time, our brief was design uh, a chair, design a table. We said like, it might happen, but first <laughs> of all, let's look at the reality of the company right now. Mm -hmm. And we give you the full platform to do it. And I think yeah. this was for us a very lux a luxurious uh, position because we could really, for the first time, also not having the stress on getting there. And we will get there, probably, making things that we really like, because of course we are designing, we, we love to you know, transform our ideas also in uh, objects that you can use. But I think this opportunity is, is really giving us the, the freedom of uh, thinking differently. And also there's something else that I want to say. I think uh, um, it seems sort of banal, but it's not obvious that a company can say, okay, come over, speak with whoever you want in the company, check where the materials are coming from, and then let's see where this is going. And this trust is fundamental because otherwise we as designers will always be relegated in doing sort of styling exercises. Or not only, I mean, you can also design a fantastic product, but still if you want to operate at this level, you need to trust each other in, in this process. And I think this is great because, I mean, we talked also with you, Paula, several times that at the end of the day, there's also many companies that do not have the scale to even have a research and development uh, office that is fully operating and fully focusing on research. But what designers could do is helping with mm -hmm. that part too, if you are willing to have a, a very transparent conversation, which is what we had with, uh, with I think Adriana. it's also, I would say it's also a matter of scale, because of course when you work with a you know, multi-billionaire, like with every you know, headquarter everywhere, they do research in one side, design in another, it's much more difficult to control the, all the process. Here, we are really talking about... Yeah, we're not outnumbering each other. <laughs> no, <laughs> like we, are, we are very like small uh, enterprise, both of us. So I think that's also the, the power of this, I think. This, mm -hmm. A size that it's the it's big but not so bad, so so much. So as we learn from this symposium, there are many types of forests in many mm -hmm. parts of the world, right? And I have a Milanese upbringing, and my big mentor was Giulio Castelli, that was the founder of Cartel. So I believe in manufacturers and furniture producers. Have you found kindred spirits in companies from other parts of the world, say? a Thai company that's doing objects in bamboo that has the same ambitions? Have you found companies that you could become twins with in different parts of the world and that you could have a symposium? Sorry, I didn't ask yeah. you this question before. You're not, no, no. It's not prepared, I'm, so I'm, it's coming up. Um, maybe, in, I mean, companies, it's difficult. We found like smaller realities. Smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very... Like for instance, I'm thinking of a project in Mexico that we are really fond about, which is more like a workshop. Um, you know, so there are realities also in Sicily. We, we, we have smaller reality, but that's also why we were so interested in, mm. in Artec. Because it has, it's not even about the scale, but it has that reputation. Ah, that so you could, you could create like a, a club. <laughs> but in a we way, should. I think that would, be, that would be brilliant because, you know, 
again, we see a, a, we see a, big, a big potential for Arctic to become a, a possible example you know, in how to deal with these realities, which are extremely, extremely complex. But also, last, uh, sorry, and then I will not add some, anything more. It is also interesting because also in the conversation we had, it's not that you say, okay, this is the reality, let's, not, let's neglect it. It is also about recognizing that, for instance, in this moment, the wood you're using, it's a byproduct of the clear cutting of another gigantic industry. And it's more the question to say, okay, how do we relate to that? Maybe the only way is to go back to education on the people working for you. Do you see what I mean? It's about, um, so, I mean, it's about transparency again. Yeah. And the education is also about the object, about understanding yeah. that an object is not something that just comes into your life and then goes, but rather something that you adopt because it comes from somewhere else. You know? And I think that that's what's beautiful about this symposium and about the conversations that we're having in Milan, in this part of Milan, um, about the relationship that objects can have with an ideal world that we're all hoping for, a world in which there's respect for, between humans and also for more than humans, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yay, so we can close it here <laughs> and, uh, and leave the stage for Elvira and Amitav. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>
centuries of exploitation, centuries of ways to try to understand, to comprehend, to even uh, this, this, dismantle, to destroy, to this demaze. The, that was unthinkable. That was impossible for the human mind to understand. No? That in a way is also part of who we are. And the forest has that specific place that can take us you know, to this sense of the sublime, to that that is unsurmountable, to that it is uh, difficult for us to understand. And I want us to start right there, no? like how, as you say, in, in the great derangement, how difficult it was for you to consider, to, or, or, or how much that was something that didn't allow you to sleep at night, you know? uh, how difficult it was for you uh, that the literature wasn't considering the, the unthinkable, wasn't, wasn't facing climate change and its consequences in a way to address it as, as you did, no? part of, uh, of these untold stories um, or, or, or let's say these, these things we share in terms of rituals, in terms of uh, the parables, in terms of storytelling, right? And, and, and we're here to engage with narrating so I want you to take us through a journey to what it means for someone like you uh, from your childhood, from those stories that your father told you, you know, in the Palma River, to here, to start writing about the unthinkable. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for that, Elvira. Uh, let me say, what, first of all, what a pleasure it is to be here in this beautiful library, and most of all, to be talking to you. I think it's one of the really exciting things that's happening today that, you know, we're having these conversations across sort of, uh, you know, many, many genres, you know. Uh, you're a curator and an artist and I'm a, I'm a writer. And I think uh, we really do have to thank, uh, in fact, the earth itself for breaking down these barriers, uh, you know, because it's because of the uh, extraordinary sort of, uh, sorts of events that we're seeing around us that these conversations have been launched. I mean, conversations that would have been unthinkable, really, 10 years ago, you know? Well, uh, you know, on the question of the forest especially, you know, when we think of forests, uh, automatically we tend to think of temperate forests, you know, or we think of uh, rain forests. Mm -hmm. But the forests that I am most familiar with which I think you will also be familiar with uh, from your visits to Equatorial Guinea, mm -hmm. is uh, mangrove forests. Mm -hmm. And mangrove forests are really completely different from any other kind of forest, you know? And mangrove forests really are sublime in the sense that, uh, you know, when you're in, uh, say, the Sundarban, which is the forest I know best, it's the largest mangrove forest in the world, uh, in uh, sprawls between India and Bangladesh. Uh, this is the largest mangrove forest in the world, and uh, you know, uh, it's home to a lot of tigers, and these are man-eating tigers, which will actually kill, uh, they actually hunt human beings. Uh, it's home to lots of crocodiles, uh, very, very big crocodiles, you know, 20-foot crocodiles, uh, lots of poisonous snakes and so on. So when you're in that forest, even though it can be very beautiful, uh, you're always aware of the sort of uh, supreme danger that you're, that you're in. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, you never actually see the tiger. I mean, if you see the tiger, it means that you, your next thing you'll do <laughs> is <laughs> you'll be gone. <laughs> I, w I was thinking also in, in something that Dan was saying in relation to our forebear, no? like how are we prompted to a relationship with the forest in terms of something we fear? and now something that can help us to, well, we need to protect, but also help us to develop who we are as a human being beyond no? the, the, the fear that caused that immensity that you are just explaining. No? How can we survive with, together with the forest? You know, that's a very interesting question because certainly within uh, the Western tradition, forests are seen as something that is quite apart from, let's say, human culture. That's why you call them, you have this word nature, you know, which is sort of opposed to culture. So there is this whole idea, which is very deeply rooted now everywhere in the world, unfortunately, which is that nature is pristine, that is free of humans. You know, whereas what we now see is that in fact, there is no such thing as a pure forest. You know, even the Amazon, 
uh, was once home to maybe uh, 10 million indigenous people. So in fact, whether it's the Amazon or whether we are thinking of say pre-contact Australia, uh, these, uh, these landscapes were in fact maintained by human beings, you know. Uh, they emerged out of interactions with humans. So the first thing I would want to say is that, you know, I, I really feel that we should leave behind this word uh, nature, you know, it's a terrible word because it makes us feel that nature is something other than us. And let's also remember that each of us is a forest. Uh, you know, if you just think of our microbiome, a half our body weight is bacteria of various kinds and flora, I mean, they're called intestinal flora, you know. So each of us in some sense is a walking forest, you know. We all have within us so many kinds of uh, millions of beings. So really the first thing I think is to stop trying to create that distance between ourselves and uh, you know, everything around us. Then once we engage with that that is ourself, how we, can make, how we can think about it in a way that we help its development in a, in a, in a sort of a process of slow growthness, right? How can we make it, because I, 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 I wanted to ask you, because also this is something that we feel in reading your books, this sense of uh, what, is, what is the turning back? No? Like, I, I, I wonder if you can take us through uh, the NACMEC, no? that some of the elements in the book to, to explain how from the 15th century, right, uh, to the present European colonialism, because of course now climate, uh, uh, climate change struggles are also related to climate justice struggles. And you beautifully take us through in a journey to, to, to make us understand how from the moment that we think European colonialism, there is always an, 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 this sense of exploitation of the air, right? Like air is treated as an inert object that needs to be somehow devastated. But it's also human exploitation that comes with it. And I wonder if you can take us to some of the examples that you um, draw in the book that, that help us also to understand that distance that we want to create, not only with the forest, but also with what that have made possible that distance and perhaps that sometimes that sense of the way we are somehow so, um, so shallowly no? um, addressing our responsibility, as somebody was saying earlier, no? our responsibility, dedicating our responsibility to preserve it. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, well, my, my, my book, The Nutmeg's Curse, which will actually be out in Italian uh, uh, in uh, October this year. Uh, well, I begin the book with this, uh, with this history uh, well, all of you will know the nutmeg. Uh, you know, the, it's a very common thing. It's always it's used a lot, even in Italian cuisine. So the nutmeg is, uh, is, a, is the nut, and mace is the outer covering of the nut, you know, the red spice. Uh, so uh, the nutmeg has been in circulation around the world for thousands of years. It was in Europe, uh, you know, long before the common era. It was in Asia, everywhere. But uh, the nutmeg actually comes from a, a very small group of islands, tiny little archipelago in the very far east of Indonesia. It's, uh, I mean, these are, uh, it's called the Banda Archipelago. And it's very difficult to get to even today. The closest place to it is perhaps Timor, actually. So, uh, you know, this is a very, very remote place. But way back for thousands of years, the, the products of, this island, uh, of these islands uh, have been circulating across the world. So merchants from everywhere used to go there. Now, once the Europeans reached the Indian Ocean, one of the first places they went to was the Banda Islands. And they wanted to seize control of the Banda, of, of the nutmeg trade. So what happened is, I mean, of, of course, the local people resisted because, uh, you know, nutmegs were their, were their lives. Uh, so what happened is that in 1621, uh, the Dutch Governor General of the East Indies, a man called Jan Peterson Kuhn, he led a fleet to the Banda Islands, and basically he exterminated all the people within, uh, within basically 10 weeks. Uh, a lot of them they killed, literally just killed with swords and burnt their buildings. A lot of them were starved to death, a lot were enslaved, and a few hundred managed to escape. 
But basically a population of 15,000 people, which had been a prosperous, enterprising population was just uh, wiped out, literally, uh, you know, within a, a couple of months. Uh, so, you know, what does this tell us about the Bandanese? What does it tell us about the world? Uh, every civilization, I think, has a story about a tree of life. And for the Bandanese, literally the nutmeg tree was their tree of life. But then it ultimately also became their tree of death. Uh, you know, this great blessing turned into a great curse. So the Bandanese were among the first people in the world, uh, really, to feel the effects of what is now called the resource curse. And we see the resource curse everywhere around us. I mean, you know, you see it uh, in devastated countries like Libya, like, uh, like Iraq, uh, Venezuela. Uh, so many other places, if you think of the Congo and rubber, what happened, uh, what happened in the Congo because of rubber, or for that matter, in, uh, uh, in the Amazon region. So in a sense, I think really that what we are seeing today is the globalization of the resource curse. Mm -hmm. You know, that in short is actually what climate change is about. Uh, that is this, we've created this sort of civilizational machine for extraction, mm -hmm. uh, you know and everything that comes in its way is uh, just uh, exterminated. Mm -hmm. You know, we are seeing uh, similar processes now occurring across uh, Asia. In India, as I speak, uh, you know, one of the last stretches of, uh, of pristine forest uh, is, uh, is being opened up for coal mining. And the indigenous people who live in the forest are being evicted. So, you know, we are really fighting, I mean, we have to be very, very grateful. Uh, indigenous peoples are uh, like, uh, I think, 15% of the world's population, but they protect uh, like 50% uh, of uh, what's left uh, of, our, uh, of our natural systems. And you were asking in the beginning, what can we do? And I would really say that we should all do whatever we can to support these indigenous communities, mm -hmm. you know? There's a very good, uh, there's a very good um, NGO called Survival International, mm. uh, which uh, really should uh, be supported by all of us. Mm -hmm. And it's so important that you say, uh, now talking about India specifically, I remember in the presentation of the book, uh, you talk about, uh, with something that for me resonates so vividly, and, and I think sometimes we, we miss the point, no? because you, you say, how in Western countries we look at the world from this perspective and really are people elsewhere, um, perhaps having the so-called global south, that are really uh, uh, you know, going under or, or, or leaving more the consequences of, of the rapacious you know, uh, uh, regime of life that we have in the north. But you, you use a term that I, I, I love for you to unpack for us a little bit, which was rapacious national extractivism which it seems to me also that it has to do with, again, another way that the politics has to generate, um, uh, 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 let's say, a, a, a political engagement with destruction, no? like this, this sense of the dissemination of, of, of all that we know and we can defend, no? as, as you were saying earlier. No? How, how you uh, consider that, no? this rapacious, uh, um, national extractivism and how you can unpack it for us as a, as a also? See, uh, I, I think what's happened now is that if you look at uh, the elites in the global south, mm -hmm. whether it be in India or Africa or Indonesia or wherever, uh, they have become just as extractivist, just as rapacious, I would say even more so uh, than the elites of the West. Uh, you know, so uh, really what we are seeing today, I mean, if you just think of what Bolsonaro is trying to do in the Amazon, uh, is, I mean, you know, he just wants to turn it into uh, like a new Midwest, uh, you know, where they have a monoculture of soya and they have these giant uh, cattle, uh, cattle farms for beef. So, you know, really, in as much as we can talk at all about the Global South and the people in the Global South who are carrying this battle forward, uh, they're increasingly, uh, uh, you know, rural communities and also uh, indigenous communities of various kinds. So, uh, you know, we have really reached a point of, uh, I would say, no return in that sense. But, you know, I think it's a, 
It is true that its people in the global south will be the worst affected and are already in many ways the worst affected. But I think it's not really just that simple. Mm. You know, because there are many parts of the global north that are also extremely vulnerable. And one of the most vulnerable parts of the world, in fact, uh, is Italy. You know, uh, in Italy now, uh, until about 2000, there used to be like 20 or 30 extreme weather events uh, every year. Today, there are like five extreme weather events in Italy every day. You know, it's an astonishing thing. Uh, Stefano Liberti has written a wonderful book called Terra Bruciata, uh, you know, where he talks about the climate impacts on Italy. Uh, Italy is, as we speak, it's being devastated. You know, I mean, if you look at the olive groves of Puglia, you know, they're being destroyed by climate-related uh, uh, problems. But I think we also have to remember that this kind of extractivism, but also this, the kind of geoengineering uh, that began in the 17th century, uh, really had Italy as its home. I mean, uh, you know, one of the most extensively geoengineered uh, parts of the world uh, is the Po Valley, mm -hmm. but most of all uh, the, area, the uh, area around Venice. And you'll remember uh, that uh, in, uh, in this area, in the Polesine region, uh, in the 1950s, there was a terrible flood already, which displaced over 250,000 people. Uh, similarly, if you, look at the, if you look at the Vaillant disaster, which also happened in the 60s, uh, uh, happened in, that, uh, in the Dolomites, uh, you know, thousands of people dead. But so what we see today, in fact, what Stef Stefano shows in his book is that uh, the Po, as you know, uh, the Po is running at record levels of, uh, uh, you know, it's never been as dry as it is today in the Po. Now imagine if the Po does actually run dry. You know, the Po is uh, Italy's most important river. So it's not the case really that it's, that it's going to be only the third world, it's only going to be poor black and brown people. Uh, people are being devastated everywhere. You think of California. Uh, California is one of the richest places on earth. California is where, you know, this whole sort of mad extractivism uh, is based, uh, you know. And now people, literally we meet climate refugees from California now. You were saying something about also, because I know you had done work here and, and we are talking about uh, land, the, the use of the land, but also you talk extensively about how it affects humanity, how it affects the, the migratory waves. And I know that you have done work uh, with migrants here. I don't know if you can tell us a little bit about it. Basically because of course, sometimes, what I, one of the things that I appreciate most of your work, and I was telling to you this earlier, no? it's like how to talk about these impossible things, right? How to make us even work of fictions, but parables in the sense, or, or you know, like those storytellings that we were, you know, used to listen when we were kids. You know? In a way, like this, this cautionary tells for the future, right? And I wonder, in your encounters with individuals that had told you the stories uh, of themselves, no? how how can you tell us about it? How 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 you how we move forward, no? In a, because it also, like when I hear you speaking about the, the, the greater the gentleman, I feel like how can we are listening this incredible voice of reason, right? Um, that is telling us the world is about to end if we don't move ahead, and we are yet listening complacently because of the way you speak first, but because we don't want to think about it. On the other hand, right? So I wonder is like how the stories of, of these people that had, had to move away from their homes because of this, from which this is no longer a word of fiction, right? Could somehow also through your practice, but also, I don't know, through something else that we, that we get, you know, people here in this room don't necessarily know, can highlight the life of us that are sitting here comfortably because, I don't know, we don't have the water coming and running out of our villages, no? Thank you. Uh, well, I became interested in the whole sort of, you know, I'm myself a migrant, so I've always been interested in, uh, in migration <laughs> and how it happens and why it happens and so on. But I spent some time in, in Venice, uh, you know, it's about uh, nine years ago now. 
And while I was there, I noticed something very strange. I mean, I've been going to Venice for 30 years, and it was quite rare to see South Asians, uh, you know, from my part of the world uh, in Venice. But uh, I noticed over the last uh, 10, 15 years, more and more uh, uh, South Asians in, uh, in Venice. And in 2013, I, uh, it suddenly struck me that the entire working class of Venice is actually from ba Bangladesh. They're Bengalis, you know, and I'm a Bengali myself, and my family came from Bangladesh originally. And it was, it was something so strange and interesting for me because not only were they from Bang are they from Bangladesh, they're from a few districts in Bangladesh, you know. Uh, the same districts that my uh, grandmother came from. So, in fact, when they speak Bengali, they speak with the accent of this district, you know, uh, which is called uh, Bikrampur and Puritpur. Uh, so, uh, you know, I started talking to them. I, start, I just became very interested in what's happening. And then uh, in 2015, 2016, during this migration crisis, the so-called migration crisis, you know, I noticed, uh, even though all the talk was about uh, people leaving water on lands and so on, I noticed that a lot of the faces that appeared in the media were actually from Bangladesh. I mean, you know, I could recognize them that they are from Bangladesh, you know. So uh, I became very interested and I wondered why, uh, why are so many Bangladeshis leaving? So I went around and I traveled all over Italy, you know, going to the, uh, the Centri di Accolienza and so on. Uh, and meeting people and talking to them. And I think it's a very interesting thing when you talk to migrants in their own language, you know, because they tell you a completely different story from uh, what they tell to the state system, you know. So it was very interesting to talk to them. And the curious and interesting thing is that many of them were actually climate migrants in some sense, because, uh, you know, they would tell me stories about floods that had, or about droughts and so on. But none of them would accept the label of climate migrant. Uh, you know, because I think it's much more complex than just climate. And I think that's the important thing to remember, you know. Margaret Atwood famously said, uh, it's not just climate change, uh, it's everything change. And that's what we are really seeing right now, you know, everything change. So I would say, for example, that climate change, the migration crisis, COVID, even this war that we are seeing now, all of these are actually, they're not causes, they're symptoms. They're symptoms of uh, this enormous acceleration that we've seen over the last 30 years in consumption, in production, in distribution. So all of these things, I would say, are really very closely interconnected. And with that interconnection, we want to open up the conversations to the public and, and continue between us, but I also would love for your voices to join us. So I don't know if anybody has you know, overcome the heat that made your neurons moving back and forth and have a question. Uh, yes, there is somebody question, right? just right here. If you can pass the mic to the third row. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank Amitav Ghosh for his writings that gave me a lot, a lot, of, a lot of intense uh, sensations. Thank you. And uh, from there, uh, I find um, some, also some solutions in esotericism. And uh, my question is, um, do you think that the spirit of the forest are still in time to save us? <laughs> I think at this point, it's more or less our only hope. <laughs> I mean, that if the earth is in fact alive, maybe it will do something to save us, because certainly we are not doing much to save ourselves. Uh, that's very clear. If, uh, in fact, if you look at every dimension of the planetary crisis, uh, everything is just getting worse. We can see that. I mean, you know, uh, every time... Uh, the climate movement gains any kind of momentum, some other aspect of the crisis intervenes. So, for example, in 2020, you know, remember in January 2020, Greta Thunberg was at the height of her fame, huge numbers of young people were turning out, and then we had the COVID pandemic, which shut everything down, put us all back in our rooms. Uh, similarly, you know, again, there was some sort of movement, then we have this uh, war in Ukraine which is, I think, in fact, uh, just a catastrophe at every level. 
you know. Uh, and it's very hard to see how we are going to find our way back from this. Mm. I'm sorry, this is not a very uh, cheerful thing to say, but uh, it's the reality. Mm. So, um, and now that I was listening to you, and, and I think Paola mentioned earlier animism, no? and we haven't talked about how important animism and rituals in, in or attending to that kind of culture is for you. And I was thinking an anecdote that I live when being a, a kid going back to Guinea, right? Like where they used to say to me, the, the forest eats everything, right? Like, and it was true, right? Like you could see, I remember my, my father, my great grandfather house is in the middle of a, a, an area, which is the, the, let's say the border between the Endue territory and the Fang territory. And he was one of the few Endues that managed to be mayor of the city. So he has this little house and every year, the forest that is behind it, it completely the house, right? And then my family had to go in there and cut it. But, but then of course, the, 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 the forest that is alive and it used to take all these things and people were like throwing things to, the, the, to nature were always things that were biodegradable, right? And the problem is that when plastic arrive and they try to do the same because they had done that forever and ever, they don't disappear. So there is a part where I think somehow the forest is giving up because it doesn't have the strength to, for instance, no, the terminate with plastic. No? But there is something, and I still want to believe that the forest can eat that much, right? Like to, to really, but it was to, we needed to, to, take, to take this sense of awareness that Plastic is a different kind of material that is not what people was using, you know, raffia or any kind of like rest of, of food, etc. So it has to do a lot with what you were saying of how indigenous culture have been somehow hijacked for another ways of living and conception that may those little moments of, you know, biodegradable things being thrown to the forest, impossible to now to live by. Anyhow. This is just one of my anecdotes, but maybe there is somebody else that had another question in the public? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, we have <laughs> another groupie that comes to join us. Yes, <laughs> um, Yes, indeed. But I have a question because um, I think there is something extremely interesting in the great derangement. When you talk about uh, illustration as a value, um, because I think you point out how uh, very often in contemporary time we think as illustration as something negative. And instead it can be a powerful tool. And I thought that was really illuminating for me when I s thought that uh, sorted out in very clear terms in your book. So I was wondering if you can elaborate more on that idea because I really am uh, grateful for that. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting to be talking about these things in this, uh, in this library. Because, uh, uh, you know, print culture has a lot to do uh, with our losing track of the world as such, you know. But even if you look at uh, print culture, early print culture, you know, going back to all the great uh, printing presses in Venice and so on, uh, the printed page was never just words. You know, it always had some sort of imagery on it. And this continued, you know, for a long, long time. I mean, we always had these illuminated books, illuminated manuscripts, and so on. But it's only in the late 19th century onwards that you, you get a pure textualism. And I think this has a lot to do with Protestant kinds of, um, you know, the anti-imagistic sorts of uh, tendencies. And the very fact that print culture comes out of Germany at the exact moment when you have this Protestant, uh, uh, you know, the breaking of images and so on on this massive scale, it has a lot to do with it. So, you know, by the mid 20th century, print culture is very, very uh, denigratory of images. You know, images are meant to be for children. Images are illustrations, images. But, you know, if you think about what images actually are, I mean, for me, the most perfect uh, uni unison or unity of image and word comes in Chinese scrolls, you know, where you see where the scroll itself becomes a palimpsest on which everybody writes over the, over the centuries. So I do feel that, you know, images, to try and bring images back into our work as writers is a very important thing. 
So for example, uh, I just recently uh, did a book. Uh, it's actually uh, a, a legend of the, of the mangrove forest. But I worked with a, uh, with a painter, Salman Tour, who's become very famous now. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of him. He had a big show at the Whitney. Ah, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, he's become incredibly famous uh, all of a sudden, and his paintings are setting records everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, an inc it was a really astonishing thing to work with this uh, unbelievably talented uh, uh, young artist, uh, you know. Just the way that we worked together was so exciting, you know. Mm. And for me, it was something completely different. Because I do feel that we have to, uh, you know, there are many solutions that engineers and people can think of. But I, I think about the word, I think about texts, about writing. And I think it's very important for us today to try and open up our texts. Mm -hmm. You know, to try and make texts collaborative. Because look at what I do as a novelist, you know. I sit in my room all by myself, I write a book, the book goes out, it goes out to an individual reader who reads in the silence of their heads. Mm -hmm. So everything in it, in it is about individuation, mm. you know. Whereas we are now facing a problem, a catastrophic problem, which is a problem of collective action. Mm -hmm. And we've actually now forgotten collective action because this whole neoliberal uh, thrust is towards individuation, you know. So for all these reasons, I do think it's very important for us, and I think it's very important for, uh, for the arts uh, and uh, for, for writers to enter into genuine collaborations where, you know, so in my book with Salman, uh, I don't, I haven't called his works uh, illustrations, I've called them artworks, because what we've tried to do is actually to create uh, a modern version of an illuminated manuscript, uh, you know? There is, um, I'm trying to remember this, and terrible and names at some point, but I, it just come to me, the word of a South African uh, historian that he look at an art piece and try to think about history making with the craft of an artwork. No? And in a way, this is what you're saying, yeah. that, that your literature and Salman's uh, painting are living in the same platform, no? and yeah, not only right. as an illustration, but also as another way of, of accounting, no? like a, that is an, of a narrating. I was thinking in Congo, which also you have work in, in, in some of the, the, let's say, the more popular painting right, that used to help to tell stories, sometimes uh, stories about colonization, stories that perhaps you know, the colonial um, mindset and ruling didn't allow for people to remember anymore. No? And, I, yeah, and I think absolutely. these are so beautiful. I don't know if there is, we have very few minutes. I don't know if there is any other question. There's a question over here. Um, Wait for, for the mic, please. Thank you. Um, actually, I think this is more a general question, but um, Especially, I guess, to Forma Fantasma and also Marianne. So you've been working on this research for the last three years. It's culminating into an exhibition. As designers, I think we have the power to somehow use illustration to really explore and disseminate knowledge. I just wanted to understand how, like what formats do you, are you planning for the exhibition to make sure that the research that you guys are planning has, I mean, is, let's say, um, understood by the public and is there some, some sort of collective action that you are inciting in terms of saving the forest and even tying it back to the fact of the, the actual citizens being empowered to help with the safeguarding of these? So just to understand how you can use, let's say, the exhibition format, the tools of designers to, to, to create advocacy um, even within, like, let's say, Helsinki or the... Yeah. Well... Uh you know, um, in, with Artec, we are in a very open conversation, which started relatively recent. So I think, well, your, your question was really complex and hinted different uh, aspects. But I think what we are trying to do now is sort of very natural progression of a work that we already started, which was um, an exhibition we did a few years ago, which is now being presented in Finland and will be expanded with new works. Um, and that is a way for us to keep the conversation to a level which is not yet fully part of what Arctic is doing. It's almost like an in-between conversation that sits in a, in a place which is 
also including, of course, citizens which will visit the place, it's in a public place. That, so that for us is a way also to position our conversation in a third place. It's not only about us, the designers and the company, but it is also a third party, which is a local institution that will put forward some of the ideas in a broader context. So it will not be about the exhibition about actually the collaboration with Artec, but rather forestry in Finland. And through this, we hope to um, have the freedom to, uh, and the time to understand the implications of what we are saying to each other and understand over time how that can lead to a possible collaboration. So in a way, it is a question of time and not only of, of format. It is a question of how much do you let a discourse grow and become something and also understand the implications of working together. So, I mean, I'm not sure I respond to your question, but it is an attempt to do so. But uh, I really believe also with Andrea that we all the time say that sort of um, short-term relationships leads to throwaway outcomes. So we also need time to get to know each other, to understand what we're doing together in a broader sense. And that's why sort of the exhibition becomes more part of our own process, our own work. And that will lead to further conversations and for the outcomes which we are already talking about. No, it is not an end product at all. I mean, of course, it becomes an end product. In which, in the moment you put it in a museum, then it's an end product. In any case, uh, you know, a different kind of product, but it's still an end product. But it's it's an ongoing it's an ongoing conversation. And of course, in the exhibition, the focus will actually be on Finland, not really on Artec fully. Artec is sort of the lens. We started thinking, okay, what do we see in these 200 kilometers in the forest where they extract timber? We don't see only Artec operating there, we see other realities. And that's what we are focusing on, <laughs> looking at how these reality intersect one another. Thank you. Just to say, uh, Simone, that um, the presentation and a show can be another stage in the process, right? Like, uh, just to say that, because I think one of the interesting aspects, and I want to connect with some of the things that we're saying here, is that this sense of um, conversations that you're having, not, right, not only with Artec, but also with the citizenship, with the institution, right? Like, how to open up that stage to something else which, for which the show is just a moment of that research, no? Like I think that that's very interesting. But I want to go back to to uh, the conversation that we're having around this notion of collective action, and and I thought also of the work that you just sent, uh, and I don't remember the it was a, a, I don't remember the title, so you had to help me here. But it's the work that you um, share with um, um, a group of uh, a reading group uh, that you have with some colleagues and other friends in New York where you were discussing the notion of Anthropocene. No? And, and one of the, the, the and, I'm, and I was there with you when you were saying, what is this work? And I remember when Anthropocene became so uh, famously known uh, among you know, people that is not dedicated specifically to that scientifically, um, of how, you know, what was the, our imprint? In, in the earth, right? And, 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 and of course, in relation to that, there is also other issues that have to do with justice, right? Like, who, have, who is the human, right? That have been um, imprinting, right? Like, that had put a step, that had, is in pronta, no? In earth, no? And, and, and why everybody else has to suffer the consequences, no? And a, a little bit, that's, as you were saying, rescuing, uh, of course, what you were saying later about Italy or places in the north. But I'd love to, for you to take us through that story, which is very uh, impactful in a way that in, it takes uh, also a parable no, of a destruction of a mythical place, the Great Mountain, right? And then, and, and what it meant to, uh, to, to consider a, a journey, you know, the journey of, of these different communities around that Great Mountain and the myth that the Great Mountain constitute, right? In order to, to consider what, what have been the impact we have in Earth, you know, the, the anthropoid, what is the story of the anthropoid, and how that parable of the anthropoid that you so beautifully narrated has something to do with us today? Yes, <clears throat> well, uh, you know, it's just a very short story that I wrote, uh, uh, you know, as a kind of parable of the so-called Anthropocene 
which is uh, uh, a new geological epoch uh, designated, you know, because human beings have now left their impact on uh, geological strata. But, uh, you know, I suppose what I was really trying to do in that, uh, in that little story was trying to see what an animist vision of the world would actually look like. And I was interested, uh, you know, to hear animism being mentioned uh, several times because, uh, you know, there's a whole movement now um, called the new animism and the panpsychism and so on. But, uh, you know, uh, this movement really sort of comes out of uh, Western universities, if you like, or uh, Western think tanks and so on. But for me, someone like me, I actually grew up as an animist, <laughs> you know, <laughs> within an animist family. Uh, and I, I think the first thing about animism that you have to experience is fear. Mm. You know, fear is what makes uh, animism possible. Mm. And of course, fear is the thing that uh, the Enlightenment wanted to destroy. Mm. You know, don't be afraid, you know. So it's curious for me. I mean, I, I, I wonder whether Western animists uh, will ever actually really be animists in the sense that <laughs> will they teach their children, be afraid, be really afraid, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But that is, that is a little bit the, the cautionary tale. I don't know if there is any, any other question. Um, we can always continue here, but I don't want anybody to, that had the urge to uh, comment on some of the readings or... No? Great. Um, another, another thing that... Uh, so let's go back to the great arrangement and, and the possibility of thinking the unthinkable or writing about it. What is the readership? Like when you were thinking about it, you, know, you, you say earlier, uh, you know, we, we, I'm sitting in my room, uh, this is delivered to a reader, the reader is, uh, again, no, uh, having this perception. But I was thinking in, in reading groups um, as something that has been like this, listening to each other, talking about our understanding of a book has been something uh, like this, this shared knowledge of spaces that have been generated recently. No? And in places like museums, this is uh, something that we, we, we're using. And I wonder what, what this collective listening with this moment of engagement that perhaps you and me, born in an animist culture, were more used to sitting down and listening to our aunties or grandparents or mothers. No? There is a moment where the character in the story of the Anthropocene says no? the knowledge has been, was given through women no? in our culture. So I wonder, um, what, what is your readership when, when, you, when you think about this? No? What is the readership, the readership of the unthinkable? Well, uh, you know, I know that people often uh, think that writers think a lot about their readership. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think this is actually the case. Uh, you know, I mean, in my case, how would I visualize my reader? My readers are in India, they're in America, they're in Italy. I, I mean, you know, how could I think of, you know, who is my particular reader? And particularly the, <clears throat> my book, The Great Derangement and so on, uh, it was impossible to think of a reader because, uh, you know, it's famously the case that if you start talking about climate change, it's the quickest way to end a dinner party. <laughs> you know, they've, <laughs> they've done a study of it. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, the very mention of climate change tends to uh, shut people off, you know. So, you know, if you're writing about something like that, and, you know, when I was writing about this, my friends would ask me, you know, why are you writing about climate change? <laughs> that's something that's of interest to, like, scientists and things. But, you know, I think what has happened in the last uh, four or five years is that the evidence of the planetary crisis is so much in our faces that it's impossible to turn away now. You know, this little story that of mine, which, I, which was published in India as a separate book, I just saw today, it's number one on the bestseller list. You know, people are buying it uh, because there is, and I really sort of urge all of you who are curators, who work in, uh, uh, in museums, I really urge all of you to sort of really 
try and pay attention to these issues because you'll see, you may think that there won't be an audience, but there will be an audience. People will come, especially young people will come in their, uh, in their hundreds, you know. This is really one way that you can start opening out, uh, you know, especially museums uh, to new kinds of viewership. Because let's, let's face it, you know, for so long, all these institutions of, of the arts, no matter whether it's, whether it's uh, publishing or it's the arts or whatever, they're very elitist. Hmm. That's the whole point of them. They're meant to be elitist. You know, that, I mean, you know, we can't be surprised that they're elitist because they were meant to be elitist. So how do you actually open them up? How do you get people in? How do you get, find new audiences? So, for example, I did a thing at, uh, you know, in Mestre, where they have a nice museum. Uh, and they tried to get the local Bangladeshi community to come. And they did come in large numbers, you know. So I think you just have to start thinking about, you know, uh, other, other ways of, um, of opening up uh, these spaces. And to me, as a director of a museum, I have to say, like, the way to do it is not to think about our audience in a way that right. it can box them in. No? I think, as you said, we all are part of a collective action yeah. where perhaps we, we have no, a forest that is already tired of trying on its own, and we have to help to, to listen to what it has to say to us, whether we fear or not, and I think that's the, that's the key here. But also to think differently. I think what, what you said in the book throughout is to say, well, perhaps what we, what we have in front of us is unsinkable, but we have to start finding ways, perhaps earlier ways in which those stories were told to us. In a way or another, this is a, this is a repeated story that we, is an impossible, no? And I, and I had this beautiful, um, I don't know if I, if, I, if I had time, I found it, which I, I thought that was so beautifully related to who you are in a way and also who we could be. And he says, the threatened being who ventures and played in the drama of the world, that is our being. How impossible is the wow of totality, necessary and illusory. It intends to force them, the human, the poet, to watch with humility, attentiveness, selectiveness, all over all fronts at once. No? This, this is, a, is a quote by Edouard Glissant of the impossible in poetry. I could, you know, like while I was rereading some of your latest writing, I thought of, of you as a, uh, and of all of us as a threatened being, no? that has to venture oneself in the world to try to solve it, to try to engage with everything, no? all of fronts at once. And for that, I'm very thankful to you and to Forma Fantasma and to Prada and to all of you for being such a fabulous and engaged audience. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank, bon you. Thank you. Thank you.